Okay. Um, I, th I think there might be more people joining slowly, but let's just uh, kickstart the meeting, the webinar today. Uh, welcome everyone. This is a great pleasure to have you on this webinar. Let me share my screen for some few minutes of introduction. Uh, so again, very warm, warm welcome to everyone joining us online. The meeting is being recorded, so this will be a, uh, possible to get it on demand. Um, my name is Benning Nabozakish. Uh, I work at the IASA as a research scholar, and I will be moderating this uh, webinar today, uh, which is um, a, a co-joint edits uh, CMCC webinar on sufficiency. And this is uh, my, my big pleasure to welcome um, my esteemed colleague and uh, um, collaborator in the so-called edits network that I will speak a few words about, um, Bianca Shoai Tehrani. So as I promised a few words, what, what edits is, um, it's, a, it's a network on energy demand changes induced by technological and social innovations. And this is actually our fourth um, uh, webinar, and we will go on with some more um, interesting topics that are all related to somehow the demand side of um, energy, the energy system. Uh, the EDITS network is coordinated by uh, the Research Institute of Innovative Technology for the Earth, right in Japan, and YASA in Austria. Uh, with a, a very welcome funding from the ministry in Japan. And what this network is, is, um, is, is a practically voluntary collaboration of um, a very strange project where uh, about 150 or over that um, researchers, experts um, join and uh, we collaborate in, in a number of ways uh, to enhance the, um, ener the energy demand side of the energy system research and um, uh, public information and policy support. So on one hand, we do some community building, we help each other, we bring together, we discuss, we, we meet regularly to have some thoughts shared, some presentations uh, and ideas uh, discussed. Uh, and these experts and researchers come from a, a, a very varied uh, uh, types of disciplines, not only energy system uh, experts, but social scientists, modelers, um, policy supporters, even industry and, and practical people. Um, we collaborate, so we de define and find uh, specific topics to work together on this energy demand side of the energy system. Um, in which we transfer methodology, ideas, and knowledge. We um, uh, share our, our um, co uh, current and relevant research. And we also identify um, topics that we can actually really collaborate. And we um, launch some um, work streams where we carry out uh, shared uh, research and modeling um, explorations. And then we inform the public or policy, um, for instance, via um, uh, the COPS and uh, some public uh, engagement uh, processes. And this whole edit builds on the so-called low energy demand scenario analysis carried out in 2018, published in 2018. And we, we inform and support policy making to enhance or engage with this um, low energy demand idea, which showed that with demand side changes on technology and social innovations on infrastructure changes, we could actually not increase but decrease the overall energy demand by mid century, um, according to the lead scenario by 40%. And um, so all the work, uh, circles around this idea. And the way we work is we have voluntary working groups uh, around different topics of energy demand, from conceptualization 
to uh, the classical sectors, buildings, transport industry, as well as model development, model comparison exercises. And we also collect and identify data or share data where um, people need it for their research. So it's really a, a flexible design where we can um, uh, come up with some ad hoc topics, but also carry on some more long-term uh, processes uh, and aligning them with our everyday research and um, policy support uh, work. And within this energy um, uh, demand topic, we met uh, Bianca, who has been a, a long-term, a long-standing um, collaborator with uh, with Yasa and Wright, and she will now speak about the um, implications of energy sufficiency on electricity demand and system costs. And um, a few words about um, Dr. Shoai Tehrani. She has been in this um, decarbonization of energy system uh, research arena for almost 15 years, uh, uh, gained her um, PhD in energy economics from uh, CEA, the French Alternative Energies and Atomic Energy Com Commission. She has also been affiliated in uh, afterwards by with Wright, and then uh, worked on uh, with the team of uh, Energy World Outlook uh, at IEA. And now she's a senior energy economist at uh, the, the the French uh, TSO um, RTE, and within this uh, role, she has been uh, working for quite some time now, years on this, um, on developing scenarios and under understanding what a change in energy demand or electricity demand would actually mean for the whole system. So one last slide on a bit of a housekeeping uh, rules. Um, your audio and videos um, of the participants will be deactivated. But we really welcome questions, uh, comments. Uh, please use the raise hand feature, uh, ideally after the, the speak, uh, speech from um, uh, Bianca, or just be send, just use the chat and send comments. I will collect them as a moderator and, and uh, put them on the floor after the presentation. So now we will have about 30, 40% presentation. Dr. Shai Tehrani, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you, Benigna. Thanks a lot. I will share my screen now. And uh, first, I, I want to apologize about my poor video because my laptop is a bit broken and I cannot open it more. So that's why you see my um, you see my my keyboard a little bit. Sorry about that. So can you see my slides? Is that okay? Yes, it's good. Okay, so thanks for the introduction, Benny. Uh, I will jump right in to the presentation. So first, I want to say that is um, this is a big um, teamwork uh, for this uh, study on sufficiency. Uh, here in the, the economics division, we have consumption modelers, um, economic uh, analysts, uh, which I am part of, and also uh, environmental environmental uh, experts on on materials that have been collaborating on, on this study. So um, uh, big thanks to all of them. Um, the outline of this presentation is uh, like this. I will first say a word of the context and objectives, uh, why we chose at RT to study a sufficiency scenario, the definition that we used, the objective and perimeter of the study. Uh, then I will say a word of the, the models that we have and the method that we used to uh, integrate uh, sufficiency sufficiency trends in our model. And then uh, the result that I will present you will be on electricity consumption, electricity system costs, and uh, material demands for batteries mainly. Uh, and then I will say uh, a word of conclusion uh, also about the further developments that we hope to, to achieve in the future. So regarding the, the context and objective, um, you may wonder why um, the the RTE wants to wanted to um, to to do a sufficiency scenario. So 
Well, as you all know, uh, recently in the search for emission cutting solutions, the focus on of international research on demand side transformation has been getting stronger and stronger. That's why we're all here in edits, uh, including low energy demand lifestyles. And that RTE, um, so RTE is the French uh, transmission system operator. That means that we own the high voltage grid lines and uh, we operate the national grid and must ensure the balance between power and consumption and generation at all times, like every minute, every second. And within this mission, um, RTE publishes projection for power, demand and supply in order to analyze uh, security of supply. So that means we publish projections for like the next winter. So as you can imagine, last winter was pretty busy, but also for like, long-term horizons. And as France has set up a, a target to decarbonize by 2050 through the National Low Carbon Strategy, uh, RTE has published the report Energy Pathways to 2050. Uh, and this report includes uh, several scenarios for carbon neutrality in France in 2050, including a scenario modeling energy sufficiency. So. Um, so what, what definition for sufficiency? In, in France, we saw several definitions around public policy. So the French national low carbon strategy by the government gave a vague definition. The, the National Energy Agency, ADEM, uh, also um, worked a lot on sufficiency, gave a definition and built scenarios. Uh, and also there are uh, research initiatives or NGOs that are working on sufficiency, like Megawatt, the very famous uh, NGO. Um, so it, all in all, it consists in reducing one's demand as a choice. So it's rooted in socio-behavioral -behavior, considerations. And for this reason, scaling up is difficult to quantify. You can have an idea of what it means uh, qualitatively, but then if you want to know how many uh, terawatt hour or, or billions you save, um, that's another uh, story. Um, and one thing that I want to emphasize that it's different from energy efficiency, uh, since efficiency revolves around technology based solution. And it might not always be effective for consumption reduction as you have a uh, rebound effect. <clears throat> so the, the research question that we seek to um, to investigate here was um, as achieving carbon neutral electricity system will imply major investment, how much can be saved through a lifestyle change towards sufficiency? And the objective of this study was to quantify the potential of a sufficient lifestyle in terms of uh, consumption reduction and also of associated economic impacts and system cost and material demand. So. Here, the perimeter is electricity consumption in France in 2050. Uh, you could study sufficiency on a much broader perimeter, like the whole energy system and beyond energy. Uh, you have clothing, food, I mean, all kinds of consumption. Uh, but here, as, as RTE, we focus on the electricity, electricity consumption. And uh, we compare two scenarios for carbon neutrality. So we have a reference scenario that's full decarbonization, but with current lifestyle trends. So it relies mainly on technological change and efficiency. And then the sufficiency scenario where we defined what sufficiency means and then translate it into what it means in terms of electricity consumption. And for both scenarios, a uh, carbon neutral sy system is model and cost are assist. So I, I just want to point out that I think this is a little bit different from what we usually do in decarbonization. I mean, usually we have this baseline system where we still continue to emit um, with our thermal power plants and our thermal cars. And then we have a decarbonized scenario and we assess how much we can cut emissions and how much it costs. Here it's different because all the scenarios are carbon neutral and um, uh, compared with the reference, we try to assess uh, how much we can save with sufficiency. And actually, we, we studied another one, which is relocation of industry. Uh, and then the assessment was how much more 
we uh, need to invest uh, to have like this additional consumption. But that's also very interesting, but that's not the topic today. So I'll just stick to this efficiency scenario. So um, in terms of um, modeling tools and method, I would say a word on our modeling tools for electricity consumption, and then uh, on how we did the modeling for social dynamics around sufficiency. So first, um, regarding the modeling of annual electricity consumption, we have a consumption model called Amadeus, that is a sectoral model, and um, it's a bottom-up decomposition of uh, demand uh, by sector. So we have the big uh, sectors, residential, tertiary, industry, transport, and then we have energy that's mainly the losses and agriculture that are much uh, smaller. And within these sectors, more than 30 uh, electricity uses are modeled, such as uh, lighting, cooking, uh, uh, using the train, et cetera. So that's for annual uh, electricity consumption. And then we translate it into um, simulation of hourly demand uh, load curve. So for this, we use historical data of load curve for each modeled electricity use, like lighting will start uh, when it's dark in the evening, et cetera. And we also model the sensitivity of electricity consumption to, um, to the weather, to meteorological conditions. So for that, actually, we work with the National Weather Organization, Météo France, and we have sets of uh, weather simulation that are input to our, sim our uh, own consumption simulations. So once we have this uh, detailed hourly demand uh, simulation, we need to uh, simulate the power generation side. And for that, we have a software called Antares, and we have all the French power plants as input in this, uh, in this software. We also have connected European countries. So in the latest model, we have 18, 18 countries modeled in this, uh, in this model. Uh, and for each scenario studied, the software optimizes the unit commitment in order to meet the demand at the lowest cost. And we also have demand side flexibility modeled in the in Antares, so demand response, EV charging, and uh, of course the interconnections between uh, neighboring with neighboring countries is also uh, modeled within the limits of the Asian countries. So that allows us to have analysis results in terms of security of supply, CO2 emissions, and also economics. So uh, in addition to that, so we have detailed cost assumptions for all the power plants, uh, flexibility uh, tools, grid lines, et cetera. That allows us to assess total system costs for generation, grids, and, and flexibility like batteries in the system uh, in the future. And uh, just a word on uh, materials demand. So the, the colleagues in the environmental uh, uh, side of the team uh, listed all the, the materials that could be used in uh, the different technologies that we are uh, studying for the system. Sorry, the slide is in French, but you get the idea like for batteries, for grid lines, for all the power plants, you need a certain amount of aluminum, copper, still concrete, a rare earth, et cetera. And we try to quantify that in both our reference scenario and the sufficiency scenario. So that was the really technical part of the, well, the modeling tools that we have. Now we will talk about how we built the scenarios that we're studying. So first for the reference scenario, we took the national objectives for full decarbonization so the national low carbon strategy. We also took like historical trends and techno-economic assumptions. So that's um, pretty classic scenario building, I'll say, with no assumption of radical lifestyle change. And we put that into the electricity cons consumption modeling, uh, into the sectoral model, which that gave us the, the reference scenario. 
And for the sufficiency scenario, uh, there, was, there was this challenge of translating the lifestyle uh, transformation into numbers in the electricity consumption model. So the social science researcher on the, in the research team did a whole um, transversal literature review on sufficiency trends that already exist, behaviors that already exist, even if they are minor. But the idea was to um, capture um, uh, weak signals from, from the field and not invent sufficiency behaviors that we imagine. We really wanted to root it in things that already exist. Uh, and we confronted it to the sectoral model for electricity consumption. And doing that, so on the social side, we identified sufficiency levels uh, by sector, parameter by parameter, in order to, to look in the model which parameters to activate in order to translate the sufficiency behaviors into um, consumption numbers. Uh, and we also had to make explicit the underlying social assumption um, going with this uh, structural modeling of the sufficiency scenario. And that's how we had this uh, joint quantification and social condition for the sufficiency scenario. So that's for the, the methodology. And if you want to see what it looks like in terms of all the lifestyle change that we identified. So in terms of, of main lifestyle change trends, you have these color boxes on the left, sharing economy, material sufficiency, deceleration, relocation, closeness to nature, that we identify from this uh, literature review from, from the field, from NGOs, gray literature, surveys, opinion surveys. And uh, we identify all the direct effect on end use consumption through a lot of um, measures or actions that you can see listed on the right. So sharing economy means um, shared facilities, equipments, um, car sharing, material sufficiency means that you don't use too much space heating, you limit your hot water use, you try to use your equipments as long as possible, things like that. Um, deceleration means that uh, you use your car less, you, you, um, you shift to uh, walking and, and cycling, etc. Relocation uh, means having all kinds of, of communities close to where you live, like by walking distance, it's the 50 minute cities, 15 minute cities, yes. Uh, shorter freight distance, etc. Closeness to nature means less processed food, less one-use plastics, uh, more biosource materials for construction. So that's for the direct uh, effect. And all these effects can be um, uh, classified in the end-use sectors. So here we see that all the effects that I quoted are um, really identified in each sector. Some of them uh, are uh, ap appear in both sectors. For instance, remote working will be um, uh, relevant in the tertiary sector. It means less use, I mean, we need less office space and also in transport because you can cut, here we model that we cut by half uh, transport for people who work in offices and can do remote working just for this uh, part of the population. Uh, so that's the direct effects on end use sectors, but there are also indirect effects on the end use on industry. Because if you reduce um, the needs for space and buildings in residential tertiary, then you will need less materials and energy for construction. And also, if you need less cars and you have smaller cars, you will need less uh, car manufacturing in the industry. So. We took all of that into account. So now uh, I will jump into the results of uh, all this uh, scenario modeling. 
Um, <clears throat> so first, uh, a word on the reference scenario, the one that has full decarbonation um, with the same lifestyle trends. So technological change and efficiency, but no lifestyle change. So on the upper side of, of the slide, you can see in 2020 or energy consumption in France, it's two third fossil fuel energy, about one quarter electricity, and then the rest in light gray is decarbonized energy, excluding electricity. So in 2050, all of this has to become um, low uh, zero carbon. So the share of electricity grows a little bit and, uh, and the rest is uh, met by the decarbonized uh, energy that is not electricity. And in the electricity consumption, uh, you can see that the, the tertiary residential are like stable or decreasing a little bit. So there is electrification, but compensated with efficiency. The transport path is rising because of EVs. Industry is also rising because of decarbonization of some processes. And then you have uh, low carbon hydrogen that the purple part uh, on the upper, upper part of the graph uh, that, that develops from the 2030s or so. So that's the reference scenario. And if you want to uh, look at how much uh, terawatt hour that represents in 2050, so today it's about 500 terawatt hours and with the electrification, it will be about 650 terawatt hours in 2050. So if we want to compare that with the sufficiency scenario, so here on this slide, you have this uh, reference scenario in the middle, in the light blue. Um, and in this scenario, you can see that it already has a lot of efficiency in it, uh, compared to a, the, the very left scenario that is a theoretical one with no efficiency. So efficiency already allows to uh, cut by uh, 200 terawatt hours, the electricity demand. And then the lifestyle change of sufficiency with all the actions that I showed uh, earlier, it allows to cut 90 terawatt hours more, so about 50% of electricity consumption. Um, now, what does that mean? I mean, all of these scenarios are decarbonated anyway. So in terms of the investments that you have um, to do for this decarbonation, we, uh, we studied uh, the electricity system that you have to build and operate for, uh, all, for all these scenarios. Uh, we actually had uh, several options with um, full renewables or nuclear and renewables. And in all cases, the sufficiency scenario allows a cost reduction around 15% on total yearly system cost. So that's uh, pretty homogeneous with the electricity consumption reduction. Um, but um, if we want to go further, so that's the savings in terms of uh, electricity system costs, uh, we can have a look at the material demand. And here uh, we can see that um, the, redu the reduction is even more important. Um, so actually we did the material demand assessment, the colleagues did that for both the electricity system and electric vehicles and batteries for electric vehicles. And batteries for electric vehicles are the, I mean, the biggest uh, impact. So I will focus on, on, on this for the, for the results. Uh, otherwise, I, I would be talking uh, one hour more. <laughs> um, but you can see on this graph that uh, comparing the reference scenario and sufficiency scenario, uh, just on the EV battery side, the sufficiency scenario cuts demand by around 30% for copper and uh, nickel. So the, the savings are even more interesting in terms of, uh, of demand materials than in terms of cost. And if we want to have a look on what are the reasons uh, for that. Um, so here on the left, you have 100% uh, of the material demand uh, for the reference scenario. So that's for everything, copper, aluminum, cobalt, nickel, manganese, et cetera. And um, when you look at the decomposition, the breakdown of the, 
a 30% uh, cut in this efficiency scenario. It mainly stems from the reduction of the number of vehicles and a little bit uh, from the reduction of vehicle size. So, well, in any way, uh, that's a pretty interesting uh, uh, environmental impact that is like twice the impact of uh, savings in terms of system costs. So in order to conclude in a nutshell, um, the, what, you, what you have to, to be aware of is that the sufficiency lifestyle scenario, it really disrupts the business as usual trend. For instance, if you look at space sharing, uh, all the surveys show that since the 1950s, French people, they would rather have uh, a nice house with a garden rather than, uh, than an apartment. Uh, so limiting the sharing space or not having too much uh, surface in your housing, that, that's not a trend that people desire today. Um, but still, if we look at the weak signals from the society right now, and we scale up this observable observed sufficiency trends, that could bring a reduction right 15% of electric consumption in 2050 compared to the reference scenario. And the savings in terms of uh, system cost, the electricity system cost that you need to build, uh, then you could lower that by also about 15%. And regarding materials, then you are more around 30% uh, uh, demand reduction. Um, of course, there are uh, some, some limits and it calls for further developments. So for instance, regarding the economic analysis, there are underlying policies for these efficiency scenarios, investment to make in infrastructure, such as collective transportation, urban planning, things like that, um, that are not quantified here, but that we should quantify and that possibly uh, will be another area of, uh, of research in the future. And the, I mean, beyond quantification, um, there is a, a big need to uh, pursue investigation on lifestyle change, uh, desirability, acceptability, so for more social science analysis uh, regarding lifestyle change. So thanks a lot for uh, your attention. And if you have any question, uh, please ask it during the, the Q&A. Thank you very much, Bianca. This was uh, very impressive. And uh, I'm always uh, very happy to see that uh, are not only researchers, so to say, but the TSO and um, and uh, yeah, different players, the market players are really thinking about the options um, towards different uh, different routes, uh, be it sufficiency or or uh, extended uh, efficiency. Now I uh, would like to call for questions. I can see um, a questions a question from uh, Nuno Bento in the chat. So I, I start with that. Um, you talked about the different uh, material demands and the implications for material demands uh, that are related to batteries and so on. But he asks, how about uranium? Have you looked at uh, the yeah dependence yes. on uranium? Uh, yes, we actually did. So the thing is, um, so in the in the in both scenarios, the the nuclear capacity is the same. So the uranium uh, demand does not change, but uh, well, but we actually, yeah, we we did look at that. Uh, um, but uh, well, we chose to uh, have this kind of common. Uh, some common um, uh, capacity levels, and then uh, the the sufficiency scenarios was uh, allowed to save things a lot on flexibility, on grids, and on on some renewable in investments. But uh, what we we could also have have chosen another modeling with a less uh, nuclear capacity in the sufficiency scenario, but that that was not the the case. Uh, in this study. Okay, thank you so much. Um, another question still from uh, Nuno, whether um, 
you looked at the implications, like kind of the positive implications, right? So, so how sufficiency changes in a positive way. Um, did you look at the kind of rebound? So obviously then more people will be using uh, public buses or you need to uh, extend the infrastructure or other impacts that are beyond the direct impacts of, uh, of a sufficient lifestyle. Is that included? So right now it's, it's not, but we really want to, to investigate that uh, further. Like, uh, of course we save because we need less capacity to, um, to produce electricity, but uh, we need more trains. Uh, we, have, uh, we have less trucks, but we have more freight trains. We have less cars, but we have uh, more trams and metros in all middle, uh, middle cities. So that's, um, well, there is a trade-off between less spending in the electricity system and more spending in infrastructure that we did not quantify, but yeah, that, that's definitely a topic that we are um, planning to investigate at some point. I mean, these uh, developments are, are really amazing. I, and you have to um, consider that you cannot in include everything. And I really appreciate that you have been taking a lot of steps already. So um, there, I, I, th I also have some more questions and I see that some more in the chat on, on these details. So really, we, I think we all just want to be informed like what it really encompasses. And before I, I um, transfer the question from Shanhu, uh, I was also wondering, and I think it's in line with this question is, um, so when you talk about sufficiency, you mostly mean um, kind of pure behavioral changes or lifestyle changes, but uh, a lot of them are really a combination of technology and and lifestyle, right? So just think about uh, the um, rollout of heat pumps. So that means you need a behavioral, a lifestyle change, as well as uh, a lot of technological. And I imagine this is really difficult to, to translate into, into uh, quantitative uh, estimates. So can you speak a little bit about how, how yeah, these assumptions are, moved into numbers so that others, uh, other modelers can also learn from this. Thanks. Yes, uh, with pleasure. Um, regarding heat pumps, it's actually, we, we, we um, put that into efficiency. So there is a lot of electrification of heating uh, through heat pumps that is already in uh, the reference scenario and in the sufficiency scenario, there, are no, there aren't more heat pumps uh, it's just that people lower the the heat uh, in their in their um, in the houses and they live in smaller houses with more shared space, etc. So the efficiency part and also the building's retrofit is already uh, taken into account in the reference scenario. Uh, so the idea was to separate as much as possible technological changes and lifestyle changes. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's uh, for the, this technological change part. And uh, to, to give you an example on, on remote working. So for remote working, we uh, took the proportion of French people who have an office work and who can do remote working. So for these people, that's about one third of French people. And uh, we also took the results of the national statistics on, on mobility surveys, so from INSEE. And in this uh, surveys, we uh, isolated the commuting um, mobility, so people going to work and coming back. And uh, so we crossed that with uh, people with an office job who can do remote working. And then regarding surveys on how much people would be willing to do uh, remote working. I mean, the big numbers are like half of the week. So we took like um, 2.5 days of remote working a week. And we cut that part of commuting uh, with cars in the mobility model. And that's how we, um, uh, we, we downsized the mobility needs uh, in the mobility model. So we didn't touch the mobility for 
leisure or, I mean, for remote working. And on the other side, so the surfaces need for office jobs uh, took into account this uh, reduction of uh, people remote, doing remote working a lot. And uh, just for office job, that reduced uh, accordingly the uh, office space necessary. So that's less construction, less heating, less lighting, et cetera, just for this part. So that's, um, well, that's one example. Uh, uh, please let me know if, if you're interested in another example or um, if that's clear or not. I think that that very well, uh, that's a very good response to Shan Hu, but uh, please um, give, give us a comment or, or speak up if that's uh, not enough. But I would also, in return to that, um, is this uh, documented and available? So can others read about it? So unfortunately, it's documented in French in a very huge report, almost a thousand pages. Um, and uh, we, well, we really want to write, uh, I really want to write a, a paper for publishing. But uh, yeah, well, with the recent developments on energy security in Europe, uh, we've been pretty busy dealing with more short-term uh, issues. But uh, yeah, with the colleagues that are named in the in the presentation, we yeah we hope that we can write uh, an academic paper at some point. Um, in the meantime, for those who can read French, all these parameters are actually uh, yeah detailed in our report. I I dropped your English summary into the chat, so anybody interested, and maybe that has a link in it to the French part, or they can anybody can reach out to you, I suppose, for the for the French reports, and uh, it would be amazing to 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 have some publication about it. And just um, from a curiosity perspective, is this something RTE really supports? So is this uh, uh, an interest of the of the industrial market players to have publications and reach out to other researchers? Um, so we we mainly publish reports in French because that's our legal missions. Um, and then if we have time, sometimes we <laughs> well we we're keen on exchanging with experts, etc. But the I mean the emergencies are always. Uh, I mean, national issues like next winter and things like that. So yeah, that we try to do everything, but in the end, we always have to prioritize uh, the, I mean, hot French issues, which is, <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, our main mission. Okay, thanks. Another question from Shonali Pahori. Um, can you say uh, more about the level of detail and the form of the model to capture the electricity demand, so a bit technical. So the sectoral right. model, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yes. Um, so maybe I can go back on the to the slides that I have uh, here. So here actually we have a uh, we have an Excel file, a big Excel file for each of these uh, these use. I mean these uh, sectors, and for instance for residential. We have um, uh, we we take from the national statistics the description of all um, of the number of households uh, in France. We divide it. We distinguish um, houses and apartments uh, with three age categories for each, uh, and then we have the number of uh, heating systems for for heating, and we project uh, electrification or no electrification, retrofits or no retrofits that will uh, change the heating needs. So that's for electric heating in residential. We have uh, all the uses are lighting, cooking, um, ref refrigeration, uh, cleaning, etc. So all the equipments uh, and their unitary consumption and the current level of use uh, per household that is documented through um, national statistics and also some data that we buy. 
and we project uh, energy efficiency improvements. We have uh, fleet uh, models for refrigerators, um, uh, dishwashers, etc. Uh, so, and and then we add everything up to have the whole electric residential consumption, and that's more or less the same for tertiary. It's not per household; it's per uh, branch, like offices, uh, shops, um, schools, uh, hospitals, um, all the branches that are detailed in our national statistics uh, institute in say. Uh, and for industry, how we have 24 subsectors that are, I think, pretty classic, like, uh, I don't remember everything, but, well, you, you can imagine uh, uh, paper, uh, cement, uh, etc. For transport, we have like cars, trains, uh, trucks, uh, and um, a need of kilometer passengers for each and number of cars uh, that um, that is deduced from that. Um, and the, the calibration is made with, uh, again, the national statistics uh, that, uh, that are published every 10 years by, by the by INSEE. Uh, and we project uh, um, model shifts uh, from thermal cars to to EVs and things like that. Um, so I hope that answered the questions. Don't hesitate if you have more, more questions. Yeah, please uh, uh, drop a comment if you would like to have some more or different uh, information. And in the meantime, I will read out um, Jihoon Min's comment. Um, regarding the material aspect, I, I also think this is very nice that you have combined that as well. And um, the question is that the electricity supply system transition is, doesn't seem uh, very much different across the, the two scenarios. Um, and the question is, uh, because low carbon electricity generation capacity can be more material intensive, which can counteract the material savings from the sufficiency component. So I'm not sure. Maybe if I you think. go back to the scenarios, you had this um, uh, column graphs up on the impact of costs. Uh, Is it uh, maybe this one? I don't know. No. No, I think it would be rather the one with the materials impact. Yeah. Yeah, that's batteries. Uh, uh -huh, that's the batteries. So, and actually, I, um, I, yeah, that would have been a lot of graphs. But if you want to look at the difference between uh, the reference scenario and the sufficiency scenario, it's mainly on rare earth. Uh, in the sufficiency scenario, you, um, if I, um, if I remember correctly. You save around thirty percent of the tons of rare earth compared with the reference scenario. Okay, um, uh, Jihoon, if you want to, I don't know if that was an answer or you want to. It's it's also possible to speak up, so I uh, we can give you. Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I maybe it relates to the first slide you showed. So I was wondering how much the the generation mix changes across the scenarios because like the renewable generation capacity per kilowatt can be more intensive in terms of like iron and copper so this transition can require more of those materials that was the question um so maybe uh i, I don't yeah i don't know what's the right graphs what that um, so here let's just look at the level of consumption so here you have the baseline consumption and here's the efficiency scenario the way we model the electricity system for both is that we let the nuclear capacity the same and the yeah the 50 percent that we didn't need uh, were downsized from renewables and uh, uh, also in flexibility and grid needs. Uh, so that, yeah, that translated like this in, in the costs. Mm 
Did you? So that okay. means yeah. In in so that that's uh, modeling choice, but uh, it could have been the scenario could have been designed differently. But here also that means that, for instance, you have a little bit less of wind uh, wind uh, capacity in the sufficiency scenario. So to save some of the rare earth for that, or um, you have a little bit less of batteries for balancing the system, things like that. I see things, but I, I guess you don't separately show the material savings or additional requirements just for the um, supply sector. Um, and yeah, not not in this presentation. But what okay. when you mean additional, uh, you mean compared to today, right? I mean compared or, to the baseline, yeah, reference. The, the baseline is fully decarbonized already, so so oh, you still okay. need a lot of. <laughs> I mean, when you're one hundred percent renewable for six hundred and fifty terawatt hours. You need a lot of materials for this full renewable system, and if you consume a little less thanks to the sufficiency side, then I you see. Okay. have a little yeah, less sure. materials as well. Okay, okay, thanks, thanks. Okay, um, then I have an uh, still another question. If we can move on, uh, but uh, anybody who has still some questions can also speak up, please. Uh, raise your hand or just write in the chat. Uh, and I would like to go back uh, to the, to what exactly the, the scenario means for sufficiency. Um, because you also mentioned that, uh, that these are lifestyle changes that are seen now, seen today. Um, um, and that's, that, that's very interesting. We also see that a lot is changing from five to 10 years. So things that we cannot imagine. Uh, is there any assumption? So is there, because it, it can be very important for the TSO, I guess, how, how then lifestyle changes uh, with the unexpected changes or maybe um, some people expect the AI changes and so on, but things we cannot even maybe imagine. Is there some collaboration or are your social scientists think uh, considering to include those changes as well or is there a specific reason to include only though like only like mainly those changes that are seen today um so yeah this was the first sufficiency scenario we ever designed so for this uh um yeah for this study we we wanted to try to see what can happen with things that already exist. And on our research side, we, we have partnerships with, um, with universities, uh, in, in uh, research, in organization, in history, to try and, and capture like more, um, I mean, signals or trends uh, that we maybe we cannot imagine now uh, but that's I mean very prospective so that did not um, that, that's part of or and un under I mean still ongoing uh, um, work on on trying to imagine what could occur but we we were not uh, enough mature or for this publication to we try to be as you know a grounded as analysis of things that exist as possible. Yeah, so maybe that actually goes to my next question. Like, do you imagine to have a, a number of sufficiency scenarios? Because uh, my other question would be that um, at the same time, some of your assumptions are, are rather conservative. So let's let's call them realistic or or, or not not that extreme. Um, which also relates to another aspect of maybe justice and fairness. Is this something that that an RTE is in power to think about? So, does it? Do you have um, a role in in making sure that everybody has um, access to um, to electricity at a fair uh, cost? Let's say. Well, that are actually issues that um, came into our focus uh, a lot last uh, winter. Uh, 
because there was this uh, government sufficiency plan encouraging people to lower the heat uh, in their homes, etc. And uh, also there were a lot of talk of energy pricings going really high and how people could be protected um, or how some weren't protected at all. So, well, our, I'd say that our main uh, focus in the last past few months was to try and really understand what happened and how the government, um, uh, the, the government actions measures of last term, last uh, winter, um, managed to protect at least uh, the residential consumers. So I'd say that we're we're still in the process of really trying to understand what was at stake, what happened, um, before drafting. You know, maybe. Uh, refined scenarios on equity, et cetera. So in order to have a reflection on this, we're more into analysis of the recent past, of recent reactions of the people. And once we get that from um, surveys of how people perceived energy transition before winter after winter and things like that, and what the data of last winter showed on people, uh, because there were a lot of uh, energy savings last winter, but was it because of the bills? Was it because people were good citizens? Um, we still need to investigate to understand that uh, and uh, and say, I don't know, interesting things about that. Okay, so we will be looking for those uh, results. So that will be interesting. <laughs> yeah. So um, because we are um, we have eaten up most of our time, I will have just lost one, one, one last question. As far as I know, there are some other countries working on similar um, scenarios um, uh, using, for instance, times or message or other, other models. Is there um, a work stream at RTE to work to collaborate with others, other countries potentially? Because you, I understand you're very focused on France. But is this something that can be rolled out to, to other yeah, locations or countries to think about sufficiency scenarios? So in terms of um, collaborations, there are a lot of things going through NSOE. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And that I'm not that much aware of, to be honest. And I know that uh, on the research side, RTE is involved in a number of European projects, that, but that are not focused on, on sufficiency. Um, but I mean, there are um, uh, channels where uh, RTE collaborates with other uh, TSOs and other uh, research uh, facilities uh, regarding the this sufficiency scenario. So all the all the I mean all the data is 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 public, but it's still being uh, rather new, I'd say. So I think it it will take a bit more time to be maybe a, a regular topic of discussion in all the NSOE and regular European collaboration channels. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, with that, I think it's a nice closing. We are happy to be part of this um, dissemination activity and we hope that uh, uh, many other countries and uh, TSOs will follow your path and um, thank you Bianca and a lot of good luck and uh, effort to to, con to continue to do what you do. Um, Thanks a lot. Thank you and thank you for our participants. Uh, it was uh, it was very nice to have you here and join us for the next uh, webinar session as well which will be announced. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot.